When I was in primary school, just a couple of days ago, when I was in primary school, I distinctly remember an assembly given by our headmaster uh, on the Holy Spirit. Uh, There are two reasons that the uh, assembly stuck in my mind. The first is because he mentioned Star Wars. In 1977, when he gave this assembly, Star Wars was my world. I ate, breathed and slept Star Wars. I wanted to be Luke Skywalker. And so any mention of Star Wars really grabbed my attention. So Mr. Benjamin stood up during uh, assembly and proceeded to tell us all about Star Wars. And, you know, this, it made this young boy very happy to be hearing about Star Wars at school. But when he started talking about the Holy Spirit, he said something that really confused me. I've been brought up in church. I've been going to church since I was very little and I knew a little bit about things. I don't think I was a Christian at the time. Probably not, but I knew some stuff. And he said this. The Holy Spirit is just like the force in Star Wars. Liz is already shaking her head at the back there. Very good. Top marks to you. Well, I, I, how old was I there? Eight or nine, I guess. And I thought to myself, hang on, that doesn't sound right. There's something not quite right there. What that done? And then in all of my great wisdom, I proclaimed to my friends after that assembly, I think the headmaster's wrong. He's got nothing to do with the force and Star Wars. Now, if you'd have quizzed me why he was wrong, I probably would have come out with absolute gobbledygook. But I just knew that there was something not quite square about likening the Holy Spirit to this impersonal force of Star Wars. I'm a little bit older now. And uh, reflecting on that statement, I think I can probably explain more clearly why I think he was mistaken. He was a good headmaster. I'm not knocking him for being for doing his job. He did a great job in many ways, even though he gave me the slipper at one point in public. Um, He was a good headmaster. But on that point, he was wrong. It's not right to compare the Holy Spirit to the force. Central to the problem is the issue of how does the Bible speak about the Holy Spirit? And with that in mind, I want to ask three familiar questions this evening. Uh, The questions are, who or what is he? Number two, what does he do? Number three, how do we relate to him? Now, I've deliberately tried to keep the pattern of the last two weeks so that as we think about each person in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Spirit... We're trying to approach those thoughts in a consistent way so we get some sort of uniformity to what we're saying. So here they are, the three questions. Who or what is he? The Holy Spirit is spoken of throughout the Bible. He is mentioned explicitly right at the beginning in verse 2 of the Bible. Book of Genesis, Genesis 1 verse 2. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surfaces of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. First mention of the Holy Spirit in the Bible right there at the very beginning. So like the father and the son, he is at the center of creation. He's right there at the beginning. Psalm 33, one of the songs of the Old Testament, picks up this idea of the spirit being there at creation. I wonder if you'll be able to spot where he is in this verse. Psalm 33, verse 6. I think I've got that up there. Yes. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. Now, you look at that verse and you think, hang on, uh, I think he's got a bit of a misquote there. The Holy Spirit's not in that verse. Well, let me assure you, he absolutely is in that verse. It's slightly obscured because of our English translation. For good reason. It's not that they've done a bad job, but it's slightly obscured because of the way that we translate the words into English. In Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, the word for spirit and breath and wind is the same word. Ruah in Hebrew. So when the songwriter here is speaking about the universe being created by the word and the breath, we have a poetic way of saying that the word, the sun, we know with our New Testament understanding, and the breath, the spirit, 
are intimately involved in creation. So that makes Psalm 33, 6 a really interesting verse. We talk about God creating the universe. And here in Psalm 33, the psalmist is saying the word <coughs> and the spirit, the word and the breath, the, the sun and the spirit are involved in creation. Interestingly, when you move over to the New Testament, which is written in Greek, the Greek word for spirit and wind and breath is the same too. Isn't that interesting? So pneuma, from which we get pneumatics, is the word that you use for breath, wind, spirit. So there is a consistency, there's a consistent connection when describing the Holy Spirit in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We'll come back to that next week as we think about what it is to be human and have the breath of life breathed into us. But for now, I simply want you to see that the Holy Spirit has been there from the beginning. When we move over to the New Testament, we find that the teaching about the Holy Spirit is filled out and we get a much clearer uh, picture of who he is and what he's about. Most importantly, consistently in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is always referred to as he. Always. Never as it. Always as he. That means our first answer to the question of who is the Spirit, we say he is a person. You start to understand why I'm having a little bit of problems with my headmaster's analysis of the Holy Spirit being like the force. The force is impersonal, but the New Testament always speaks of the spirit with that pronoun he. It's a personal pronoun. He. He's not a force. He's not electricity. He's not pure energy, but rather he is the third person of the Trinity in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. He is referred to as God's spirit which means he is fully God, but he's also distinct as the Father is distinct and as the Son is distinct, so the Spirit is distinct too. It's not that the uh, God is sometimes the Father and then sometimes the Son and then sometimes the Spirit. God is those three persons united always together, but different persons within that trinity. The three of them have enjoyed eternally fellowship and love and connection together. So that fills out our answer a little bit more. He is God, the Holy Spirit, a true person, yet one with the Father and one with the Son. Jim Packer, who I find very helpful as a Christian thinker, uh, says this. The Spirit then is he and not it, and he must be obeyed, loved and adored along with the Father and the Son. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is Spirit, sort of in the title, isn't it? He is spirit. He doesn't have a body like ours. And so we need to avoid any sort of simplistic notion that we've got three people with bodies meeting in some other dimension, talking together eternally. It doesn't work like that. But while that's true that he doesn't have a body, we do know that it is quite inadequate to think of him as simply an impersonal energy. That's not what he he is. He is a person. God, the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity. Now, from that, we go to our second question. What does he do? Now, I'm going to give you five things that he does. This is not an exhaustive list. He does more than this. These are the five that I've picked out that will be useful for us tonight when thinking about his work. Um, We're going to move at some pace as we work through this uh, second question. So uh, try and stay awake. I had such an excellent lunch today. I'm struggling to stay awake myself. So if I catch anybody falling asleep, it's all right. I won't hold it against you. But uh, just try and keep up if you can. Uh, We're going to go at some speed. Let me start by talking about how the Bible as a whole sees the work of the Holy Spirit. In general terms, the Old Testament, that's the first half of the Bible, looks forward to the second, the New Testament or the New Covenant. So we've got predictions about what that new covenant will be, uh, a new agreement that will be better than the old covenant that God made with his people. One of the ways that the new covenant would be better than the old covenant is particularly in the way that the spirit works and operates. There's a change from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, to the New Covenant in the way the Spirit works. Now, let me just give you a couple of quotes from Old Testament passages that are talking about the New Covenant. And these are passages that speak about the work of the Spirit. God says, Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you 
and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So there's one of the predictions about the new covenant. He is going to, in some way that's different to the old covenant, put his spirit in those who are his in the new covenant. Or this quote from Joel chapter 2. Afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Again, prediction about the new covenant. And what's uh, important there, what's significant is he's going to pour out the spirit in a different way to he did in the old covenant. In the old covenant... The Holy Spirit, in general, comes on people, certain people, for certain tasks, for a certain time. Everyone in the Old Testament who worked for God was empowered by the Spirit for that task in a certain way, in a limited way, for a limited time. That's how the Spirit operated in the Old Testament. In the New Covenant, so we're now moving into the time of Jesus and the Gospels, we're told that Jesus is the one who is given the Spirit without limit. So there's no limit on the empowering and uh, work of the Spirit in the uh, life of the Lord Jesus. That's different to the Old Covenant. And then everyone who comes after Christ is given the spirit at conversion. When you become a Christian, you gain the spirit. The spirit is the gift that is poured out onto us at conversion. That means, as far as I can tell, the description of being baptized in the spirit in the book of Acts is a description of conversion. It is the pouring out of the spirit onto the life of a man or a woman in a way that was not the same in the Old Testament. The fulfillment of that prophecy that I've just read in Joel actually is happening 800 years later at Pentecost. So Peter, there with the other disciples, stands up. He preaches to this huge crowd who are questioning what's going on and saying, all these people, they're doing strange things. And Peter says, this is a fulfillment of the new covenant prediction. I'm going to pour out my spirit on people. And you're seeing it. It's happening now. So thinking about that along the Bible timeline, we have believers in the Old Testament experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit at various times to enable them to know and serve God. Then we come to Jesus, the beginning of the New Testament, and the Spirit is poured out on him. He is the true Israelite, the true Son of God, who has the Spirit without limit. And then from him, we have a new community of men and women, the church, people from Israel and from outside of Israel, so Jews and Gentiles, who are in relationship with the Lord Jesus and have the Spirit poured out on them. So in that way, we can say that since Jesus has been raised and gone back to heaven, we live in the age of the Spirit. How do we know and experience God today? We know and experience God today by the work of the Spirit. There is no other way to know, truly know and experience God other than by the work of the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. And there are some distinct and key things that he is described as doing for us today. And I'm really grateful to uh, Wayne Grudem. As usual, over the week, I've read lots and lots of different things. I, Wayne Grudem has written a book called A Systematic Theology. Um, it's not a short read. It's fairly chunky. But there are some really good breakdowns he does there. And a lot of this I borrowed from him because I just found it so helpful. I just thought it was the, one of the best breakdowns I've had on what does the Holy Spirit actually do. So much of what this is has come from him, and I'm glad to admit that too. So here are the five things that I would say are key and central to the work of the Spirit today. Number one, he empowers Now, let's start with Jesus here. At the start of Luke's gospel, we were looking at this not very long ago. Luke makes the point at the beginning of Jesus's public ministry that not only does the spirit come down on Jesus at his baptism, but then he goes out from his baptism into the wilderness and then out into his public ministry. So that three times in the power of the spirit. So how is Jesus, the son of God, empowered for his ministry here on earth? Luke's answer is really clear by the work of the spirit. 
That's exactly how Peter sees it in the book of Acts. This is how he describes it. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So God anoints Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. How does Jesus fulfill his ministry? By the power of the Holy Spirit. That's quite encouraging, isn't it? Well, I think so. And just as Jesus was empowered uh, for the work by the Spirit on him and in him, so we too, as his people, are enabled and equipped for work by the Holy Spirit. Here's the promise to the apostles, Acts 1 verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So he empowers. The apostles do their work because the Spirit comes on them and they are empowered for the work that they do. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the apostles. Jesus is empowered. The apostles are empowered. And then 1 Corinthians 12. We are empowered and equipped for the work that we do for Christ today by the Spirit. This is what Paul says. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Put simply, that means that any service that I do that is of eternal value is enabled by the Spirit. That's a very humbling thing to realise. Everything that I do that is of eternal value, the Spirit equips me to do. And that passage in 1 Corinthians 12 then goes on. Paul goes on to list various gifts that the Spirit gives to his people, to Christians, those who are following the Lord Jesus. And that list is really interesting because it is variety of the, uh, gifts that the Spirit gives. We're each entrusted with gifts that we can use for his glory, for the good of others. Speaking gifts hospitality gifts, administration gifts, all because he equips us for this great work of changing the world. The Spirit does that. I was talking to somebody on Friday uh, from a mission organisation uh, that had come over to talk to us, and uh, during the part of that discussion, one of the things that uh, one of the ladies who was there said was, she found great joy in discovering for the first time that administration was a gift of the Spirit. Isn't that encouraging? So she'd always thought that her job of administering and sorting things out and organising things was just mundane. It just had to be done and somebody had to do it. And then to read or be shown in 1 Corinthians 12 that administration actually is a gift of the Spirit really encouraged her. Now, I want you to understand that, that service in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Whatever that service is, whether it's putting out chairs, whether it's administering things and making things, sorting things out uh, in that way, sorting out the money, uh, speaking to people, leading groups, all of those gifts to do those things are given by the Spirit. So they're not yours, they're a gift from Him, and they're given for God's glory and for the good of others. The Spirit does that. Isn't that great? Secondly, He purifies. So not only does he empower, he purifies. Of course, he's called the Holy Spirit. And part of his work is to make us holy, to purify us. And he do, does this in two senses. The way that the Bible speaks about the work of the Holy Spirit to make us holy is, is talked about in two different ways. Uh, firstly, at salvation, we are set apart. We are declared holy. We are made separate for God. Sanctify is the word that's used there. So 1 Corinthians 6, you were washed, you were sanctified, talking to Christians, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. So who is the one that affects salvation in, in you and separates you from the world and separates you for God? Well, that's the Holy Spirit. He does that. But there's an ongoing work of the Spirit to purify too, to sanctify in an ongoing sense make us more and more into the men and women that God has designed us to be, namely, to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit does that work too. Listen to Romans. So this is Romans 8.13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Paul is saying there, there are two ways to live. 
I can live to please my flesh, that is my sinful desires, or I can live by the spirit. And what he means there is that if I live not only according to what the spirit teaches me, but by his power, I will live. That's the work of purifying and transforming, sanctifying and changing us into the image of Christ. I find that very challenging. The spirit is working as I am reading my Bible to challenge me and convict me and bring about change in me. And he's empowering that change by his work. So he purifies. Thirdly, he reveals. Now, we've looked at uh, this verse that we're about to read in the first session when we were talking about the Bible. So it should be at least familiar to you. Not much of a surprise. Uh, Second Peter one. Prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's back to what I said before. How do we get the Bible? The Bible is not just a collection of a few stories by a few random people that decided to write those stories down. Peter says that the people who wrote down the words of the Bible for us were carried along, moved by the Holy Spirit. He revealed what was to be said. But not only does the Spirit reveal to us in that sense, supremely and specifically he reveals to us Christ. Talking about the Holy Spirit, Jesus says this, John 16, He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now some would see this as perhaps the key work of the Holy Spirit, to glorify Jesus, to reveal Christ to us. So a church that makes lots of Jesus, that talks about Jesus a lot and is thrilled with the Lord Jesus Christ and wants to talk about him all the time to people and to each other, that is, I would argue, a church that is experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit, the revealing work of the Spirit. Now, please don't misunderstand that. The Holy Spirit reveals Christ by speaking through the Bible supremely into our hearts, mediating Christ's presence to us in a way that is entirely consistent with everything he says in his word. But the way that I know the truth about Christ, the the real Christ of the Bible, is by the work of the Spirit. He opens my eyes spiritually, so I see Christ. When I'm rejoicing in who Jesus is, when I'm thrilled at his grace and goodness, when I'm longing to see him face to face, that is the work of the Spirit. He is doing that in me. Fourthly, he unifies. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. This is a great verse, great Trinity verse. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So this is Paul's prayer for the church at Corinth. He's praying that they'd know Christ's grace, the love of the Father, and then the fellowship that comes from the Holy Spirit. And that idea of fellowship is one of connecting together in unity and working together and worshipping together and striving together. So that work, as Paul's praying for it, is the work of the Spirit. That's what he's praying, that they would know more and more. Paul says a very similar thing in Ephesians 4. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Now, I know that Paul is encouraging our effort there, but he says the unity that we've already got is the work of the spirit. How have we been brought together? So lots of us here this evening are Christians and I rejoice in that's wonderful. But why are we all together in this building? Why are we doing this? But we're not exactly alike, are we? You know, naturally speaking, we may not have been spending time together this evening. We're here because the Spirit has brought us together and united us in Christ. And yes, we can mess that up. We can ruin that. We can work against it or we can encourage it. But the, the, the unity that we have is a gift from him. He brings unity. Fifthly, he comes alongside Now, this is very much like the equipping in point one, but it seems to me that Jesus makes such a lot of this in John 14 that I need to mention it under a separate heading. Listen to what Jesus says, John 14, 16. I will ask the father. He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, forever. Now, this phrase, another advocate, is so wonderful that I just want to take a couple of minutes to explain it to you. 
Firstly, Jesus says, I am going to send another advocate to you, which, of course, implies that they have already experienced an advocate. So they're going to be sent another one. They've already experienced some advocate. And that first advocate is Jesus. He is the one who has been their advocate and their friend who stood beside them, their very best friend, their Lord, their master. And Jesus says, I'm going to the father and he's going to send you another advocate. Think of how encouraging that would be to these men as they face Jesus' death. Another advocate like him who would come. Second, the word advocate means someone who comes alongside to comfort, to encourage and to strengthen. In the older translations, uh, we have it as another comforter. Now, when I think of comforter, you can think of blankets, you know, sucking your thumb. Or you can think of maybe a stiff glass of something. That's a sort of a comforter, uh, southern comfort, that kind of idea. But of course, it doesn't mean it in that sense. In the older translations, it's the older word for comfort, which means to fortify, to bring fortification, to strengthen. The word that's translated here means literally somebody who is called to stand beside somebody else, called alongside. So it's to do with uh, legal defence. It can be used in that context. So if you're up in court, and uh, Alan has offered this to me, uh, this is very kind of you, my brother. Uh, you know, if I ever get into trouble, I'm trying not to, but if I ever get into trouble, he would come and stand beside me and help me out. Well, that's the idea. Someone who will stand beside you, you know, a, um, a legal counsellor, somebody who knows what they're doing, who's who understands and will stand and defend your case, defend you. Or, or it can also be used of somebody who's called alongside to strengthen somebody who's in combat or somebody who's in some sort of difficult situation and needs particular help in that situation. Somebody who comes alongside and helps. Now that is wonderful when it's applied to the work of the Holy Spirit. He not only empowers, he not only purifies, he not only reveals, he not only unifies but he also comes alongside to encourage and stand with us in all the things that we face. I find that really moving. I'm not alone because Jesus has gone to heaven and promised that another comforter would come, the Holy Spirit, to be with me forever. And as a church, we are not alone because the Spirit is here. Even if there was only two or three of us here this evening, God, the Holy Spirit, would still be here with us. Isn't that amazing? The creator of the universe, the one who has seen all things, he would be here and we would know his work. Now, that's pretty uh, tough going. You've stayed with me pretty well for the last 25 minutes. We're going to have a little break there. Not a cup of coffee or anything like that. Don't get excited. Uh, What I want you to do is just in in small groups, maybe twos, threes, Just talk about ways that you've experienced the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want you to go too wild. Don't give any too weird stories. But, you know, ways that you've known him come alongside and encourage you. Now, that might have been through somebody else. Because, of course, he does equip people with the gift of encouragement. So it may be that he sent somebody alongside. But just times in your own life, perhaps, where you've experienced that. Have a think about that and then just talk about it in twos and threes. Or if you don't want to, you can sit there and you can think about it and rejoice in your own heart privately if you'd like to do that. But there you go, just for a couple of minutes and then we'll come back to the last point together.
Well, it's encouraging to hear some conversation. I trust that means that you have experienced something of the Spirit's work in your life. Uh, he is gracious and kind, and he, uh, he acts in all sorts of ways to uh, encourage our hearts, to bring us closer to the Lord Jesus, to speak into our situation. We're so grateful for that work. Uh, it's not just, as I said a lot of times through this series, it's not just an academic issue. We're just not interested in ideas the work of the Spirit is a powerful work in our lives. We're so grateful for his work uh, in us. So let's end with this last question. How do we relate to him? And I want to end tonight with the question that I've ended the last two sessions with. How, how, how is that personal? What am I meant to do in terms of relating to this person, this wonderful person? And I've got uh, three verses here that have challenged me uh, about my ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit. Um, and I'm going to give them to you uh, with only a short explanation after each one, and I'm going to leave you to ponder them over and think them through for yourself. Um, so he, how do I relate to him? Firstly, don't offend him is the instruction. Don't offend him. Ephesians 4, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now that verse is often used as a proof text for the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person, i.e. you can't offend an energy or a force, so he must be a person. That's true. But if you only say that about this verse, you miss what Paul is actually saying. Don't grieve him. Just need to hear that. Don't grieve him. In other words, don't live and act in a way that makes him Sad, that's understating it, but don't live and act in a way that makes the spirit grieved. It ties in with his work, I think, to purify us. If he is working to make us into the men and women he desires, to make us more like the Lord Jesus, then don't resist that work. Don't work against him. Because what will happen is we will lose the experienced joy of the presence of God. Now, I don't mean by that that we will cease to have our salvation or that we will lose the Holy Spirit, because I don't think that's possible for those who are truly believers. But we will certainly lose the experienced joy of his presence. Don't grieve him. He is working in you to bring about change. Don't Grieve him. Secondly, keep in step with him. Galatians 5, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, perhaps one illustration will help here. When I go walking with my brother-in-law, Martin, he has very, very long strides. He is taller than I am, and uh, consequently that means his legs are longer than my legs. 
That means when he is leading the walk, I need to not only go where he is going, because invariably he has the map whenever we go anywhere, but I also need to keep up with him, which is not a small feat. The Holy Spirit is taking us somewhere, metaphorically. There is a journey that we are on, that we are walking along spiritually. And often it's down paths that we are reluctant to walk down, not because they're bad paths, but because they are difficult paths. And it's not always at the pace that I want to walk at. Sometimes he's going faster than me. Sometimes he's going slower than me. And I want to run on ahead. But I am called to walk the Christian life by the Spirit. That means in his strength, certainly. But it also means responding when he leads to act and live in a way that he's calling me to act and live in. I need to follow. I need to keep up. Keep in step with the Spirit. Thirdly. Let the fruit grow. What is the evidence of a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit? Is it speaking in tongues? Might be. I think probably you're on safer ground with Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. These Things are the effect of the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. I always find this list a challenge because I know I am too quick to resist the growth of this fruit. But if I'm keeping in step with the Spirit, then I will respond in ways that allows the, this fruit to increasingly grow. conclusion who is the holy spirit he is a person he is the second person of the trinity he is god secondly what does he do well he empowers he purifies he reveals he unifies he comes alongside thirdly how do i relate to him i must not grieve him i must keep in step with him and i must let the fruit grow